over a thousand names in the top level uh, domain, domain space and they're being added about five every week. So what this means is uh, consumers have a broader choice of, of names that they might choose. Uh, so you could choose dot photography, you could choose dot club, you could choose uh, dot email, you could choose dot shabakan, uh, you could choose uh, dot tie. Uh, so there's a thousand top-level domains, and there's about a hundred or so that are not in uh, not in ASCII, not in uh, Latin character sets, or the limited ASCII character sets. And that uh, so the you can go to the Domain Name Commission website and see which registrars are IDN capable and friendly and also which ones are DNSSEC capable. What, what Dom was talking about is more actually at the other end, registering at one end but getting it to work. And in fact, when Don approached me about this, the link he sent me, when I clicked on it, it didn't work in my browser because a particular ISP I'm with doesn't seem to have the support for them. So the first step is getting them into the domain name system, but yeah, the next step is actually getting them more universally accepted. Comments, questions from others? Please. Uh, my name's Kratiana Toyota. So um, I've just completed some research on IDNs with um, government departments. And it was, it's worth noting about 60% of government departments don't accept an IDN email address. Um, and a number of other large organisations uh, don't accept IDNs either, so there's definitely a technical issue that needs to be addressed. And just um, from my perspective, just online forms just require a little bit of JavaScript, and you can, yeah, just to change the IDN um, into um, some other, you know, into code so it will come through. So. It's Stephen Heath. I'm with the Domain Name Commission. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably even worse than that because historically a lot of websites and applications only expected to see a two-letter domain name or a .com, .net, .org. And so the new domain names like photography, um, guru, club are, aren't even being accepted. So so that's even a... The third-party support is, is poor at best. Um, so if you have a, a, a new age domain name, you probably have... Well, your mileage will vary on the success of that, of using that. And I think, Stephen, even within .NZ, for certainly the first few months, there were quite a few websites that if you tried to put .NZ as your domain name rather than dot something .NZ, it said this isn't a valid domain name. That's, well, for, so for example, I use Chrome generally. Um, the first time I went to say any name .NZ, it would actually bring up the Google search, and you click it. The next time I put it in, it actually realised, oh, it's a real domain name. So IE was better. Firefox, I think, was worse until they upgraded. Yeah, so, so the new domain names are, 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 are a, a new era. It's certainly a, the biggest change in domain names since since the deployment of domain names in the 80s. So um, it's it's a brave new world out there, and IDNs are just one, of, and the acceptance of IDNs are just one of those issues. Might just swap to the more global issue briefly, and if Jordan at the back doesn't mind, maybe Jordan, just a quick update on, I guess with the transition from the US government, what are the key outstanding issues that I guess we, agreement needs to be reached on that could sort of derail it, and what perhaps from your point of view is of the important non-negotiables to actually make sure happen? Because we all want a transition, but a bad transition could be worse than a good trend, well, worse than the status quo. Okay, um, unprepped. Uh, how long do you want me to talk for? Two, uh, two or three minutes? Yeah, that's right. right. Um, so, uh, in summary, the, I, David mentioned IANA and ICANN. The Internet Assigned Numbers Authority that ICANN runs does three things. It does domain name, root, IP addresses, and protocol parameters. And since last March, uh, the internet community has been devising a plan to transfer away from American government control through the contract. They, the numbers and protocols people finish their draft plans in January. Uh, the domain name people finished their draft plan in July, June, about three weeks ago in Buenos Aires at the ICANN meeting. That's now in a process of reconciliation to see if they're all consistent with each other. And then if they are, uh, that there will be a consultation on the integrated plan for this transition. Uh, if they are not, one or more of those plans will be sent back to the communities that wrote them to say, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, not yet clear whether that's going to happen or not. 
Um, as you mentioned, David, there's a linked process. It isn't just about saying, let's end the contract. It's also about saying, without this accountability to someone, in this case, the US government, ICANN's own internal accountability situation needs to be improved. Uh, for my sins, I'm on the working group that's trying to come up with some consensus proposals to achieve that. And the, the broader transition proposal has got some dependencies in it that depend on this accountability improvement. So if that work doesn't come to a conclusion, and that's probably going to be in October that the plan will be signed off, hopefully, in the ICANN community, that will then kick back the broader transition as well. So in terms of the time frame that's now on, people are hopeful that both plans will be ready for adoption in uh, October this year. At the, US, the Dublin meeting. At the Dublin meeting of ICANN. Um, the US government has said it's going to take it around five months to assess the completed, completed plan and give congressional scrutiny. Uh, so that takes you through, if it is finalized in October and the various changes to ICANN that flow from that are implemented uh, early next year, you might see the transition happening in June or July uh, next year as the earliest point. Um, in terms of key issues uh, that we've been advancing as Internet NZ, uh, a real accountability settlement is key. You know, the, the operation of the route is really important to us. We don't need some random reallocation of .NZ to who knows where. Uh, so it's really important that the integrity of that system is protected, and that requires, in our view, uh, a really accountable IANA operator. The other core feature that has been one that we've been arguing for through the whole process is to say that uh, it's useful to separate bits of this process into different organizations to kind of distribute the responsibility and mitigate the risks of one big controlling entity. And the NAMES proposal does do that. It suggests a legal subsidiary of ICANN to operate these so-called IANA functions, and ICANN remains the steward and the policy body. So there's been some discernible shifts in a direction that New Zealand pioneered with the way it set up .NZ in 2002. Um, at the moment, it doesn't look like there are any deal breakers, but getting the accountability stuff is really important. And as you would, if you're a corporation with a lot of money, uh, there's always an institutional interest on ICANN's part to minimize its external accountability, to maximize its freedom. That's a natural thing that bureaucracies do. Uh, and so getting community consensus on a, a strong accountability settlement is going to be a really challenging thing to do in the next few months. So I hope that was what you're looking for. Now, thanks, Jordan. Further comments, questions? Otherwise, I'll have some questions for the audience. Please, up the front. Thanks, Laura. Paul Spain, Podcast CNZ. Um, I'm curious in uh, where we're going with the adoption of the shorter .NZ domain names, and you know, those of you maybe with um, larger, more influential organisations, whether you know it's a consideration to change from .co.nz to uh, to .NZ as a primary domain name. Yeah, that's sort of the question I was leading towards. I've noted, like, I was quite pleased my local, I live in Thorndon, and the uh, Thorndon Book Fair, or the Thorndon Fair was just Thorndon Fair dot NZ. I thought, that's the perfect one. It's not an organisation, it's not a network, it's not a company for that. But of those in the room, I'm assuming, does how many people have a domain name under dot NZ generally? Hands up. So almost everyone. How many have got one directly at the second level now? around half and were, have any of you did you have rights to one at the second level with the preferential registration but you chose either chose not to get it or did you miss out you just didn't uh, get in within the six month period etc um, be interested in feedback whether that was sort of long enough six months to make a decision on whether you want it or not so did anyone miss out on getting their one there is anyone conflicted where someone else has rights to their name at the second level and there's been, you can't agree, yep, you've got some conflicts. The, the other thing I've seen uh, was a lot of global organisations who uh, had the management of their domain names in some big US companies and they seemed to uh, miss out. A few that I was watching I alerted, so Microsoft for instance uh, just about lost Skype.nz, Xbox.nz, a bunch more. Um, 
Well, they never. Yeah, they well they lost the preference to them, and that happened to a you know a huge range of of others. Uh, a few of them I alerted, and uh, one of their local employees just sort of ducked in uh, as it went public with everyone else and tried to grab them. Um, so I don't know if anyone else was impacted that way. Stephen. So at the moment we have, so DynZ has just shy of 650,000 names uh, registered active. There's approximately 95,000 direct at DynZ, um, of which about ballpark 30, or probably close to 50,000 of those were resulting from names of rights. So either the exclusive rights, the register or reserve the name. And there's another approximately 18,000 names that are still have reservation status, so they can turn that into registration any time before September 2016. Um, a personal uh, story of, of domain names, I, I got a domain name for, for my wife, uh, it's her last name .nz, and she gets people saying, uh, you've missed something out of the domain name, and so they insert it, like a .co, uh, of course it bounces, um, she, she really, it's really quite fascinating the behaviour of a domain name in New Zealand had three parts, so regardless of what's written down on paper and everything, is they insert bits into the name. Or, or they just don't know what to do and so they don't email. It's quite fascinating. Um, I think the biggest user of probably .nz name and direct I've seen lately is um, Newsworthy, the new TV show on TV3. Oh. They do newsworthy.nz. So that's uh, every, they're, all they're advertising for there is, is newsworthy.nz. But it's, it's going to take time. It's an adoption. If we all knew that, it would, it would happen. If we look back and if we go forward five years' time, it will be like, it was fine. That's, oh, sorry, that's my personal view. Anybody else? David. Um, just a, a couple of points. I'm David from NZRS uh, uh, with the registry for, for the .NZ names. Um, in terms of uh, adoption, about a third of all new uh, created domain names are registered at the second level. Um, so adoption has been quite high. Um, Within our research team, one of the things we're doing on a regular basis is uh, a zone scan, and we're looking to build greater intelligence and understanding the trends over time. So hopefully over the next um, several months, we'll be in a position to start um, sharing with the public what's happening in the, in the .NZ space in terms of not only what's being registered, but also what's actually being used and how they're being used. So it's uh, very much a sort of a, a watch and see and um, a report back. On a related issue, those who follow the sort of global politics with the domain names is there's a big debate for the GTLDs about who is policies, where most GTLDs at the moment allow what you call a proxy service, where you don't have to give your name address, basically you give the name address of the proxy, so it allows you to effectively anonymously um, have a domain name. In New Zealand, we don't have a proxy service. Um, in a formal sense, people don't have to actually use like their home address, they can use PO boxes, but they do have to supply correct, accurate contact information. We will be starting a sort of first principles review of that policy in the next 12 months. So there will be some formal workshops and seminars around that. But interested in views of people have them in the room about the pros and cons of whether um, allowing a proxy service is a good thing. I mean, it's far more than just that, what we'd be consulting on. Uh, the sort of arguments can be, well, you have choice of top-level domains. If you want to use one with a proxy service, you can go to .org. Um, there are certainly advantages to requiring actual names of people in terms of uh, when bad things happen um, associated with domain names, it means that there's someone you can contact about them. But yeah, um, it's a huge debate though between probably privacy, civil liberties people who we sort of think in New Zealand, look, it's you know, fine use of, you know, uh, you can say what you like without too many consequences, even with the HDCA now. Uh, but in other countries, you know, actually it's a quite important right probably to be able to um, have a site uh, where you do have a nominal speech. But is speech, though, linked to having your own domain name? You can, of course, just get a subdomain uh, from many others. So, yeah, any views on sort of the who is privacy issues as we uh, go into the review in the next 12 months will certainly be welcome. Chris. Thanks. Uh, I've got reasonably strong views about the uh, use of privacy proxy services. Uh, and you I may want to mention your role for those who, <laughs> uh, even if you're not speaking in that role. Uh, I'm not speaking no, in my role, okay. which is as okay. the ICANN Ombudsman. Uh, although 
uh, I will um, step out of role and then into role. Uh, so out of role, uh, my major concern is the uh, protection of people from those countries where uh, you want to run a website and a domain name uh, to promulgate unpopular views. Uh, and to have your address there could have potentially fatal consequences. And I I'm, I'm not saying fatal is an exaggeration. Uh, there are people out there who would just take you out because you are opposition. So I'm concerned about that. There's also the issues of doxing. Doxing, if you don't know the term, is uh, where someone's details are taken from something like a WHOIS service and they're then uh, sent large amounts of spam and all sorts of other unpleasant things to their own address, uh, using that address for um, effectively trolling. So there are those issues as well. Uh, and uh, the other side of it, of course, is that if you're in business, there are many people who say that your details ought to be open and public so that if there is a problem with the services you're providing, whether it's fraudulent or just incompetent, you ought to be able to contact the real people instead of a privacy proxy service. So there's a conflict between those two different principles. And there are some annoying things which happen as well. Uh, I recently bought a couple of uh, new uh, top-level domains, uh, just silly little ones like lahat.lawyer, uh, because I just wanted to. Uh, and uh, I didn't bother using a privacy proxy service, and it only took about 24 hours before the first set of uh, spam inquiries came in saying, we can make your website wonderful, and, and I've had a set steady stream of them thereafter, which is clearly an abuse of the yeah. Whois service. Uh, and there are plenty of people who will want to do that. But I think the correct response is a, is a proportionate response. And by proportionate, I mean you have to put into proportion the value of protection of privacy uh, as against the problems you face with uh, criminal uh, and uh, other bad players on the internet. Uh, and I think when you balance that out, the need for privacy rather outweighs that as long as you have in place some mechanism for legitimate inquiries to be made as to the actual owner or user of that domain name. Uh, and the answer is not complete suppression or complete openness, but mechanisms by which you can access that material. Can you explain how you determine legitimate? No. <laughs> uh, th no, that is a real problem because um, uh, th th there has to be a proper process put into place, a protocol policy adopted to enable legitimate players to be identified as legitimate players. For example, if it was the New Zealand police trying to find the owner of a domain name which hosted child pornography, I don't think anybody would have any problem uh, with pursuing that. Um, if, on the other hand, it was somebody trying to um, uh, obtain material to sue somebody in a civil arena, you might have more of a difficulty with that. Uh, so you have to have a good debate about who should have access and how that access should be obtained. Yeah, perhaps an example of the balancing act. I know I saw on Twitter recently, I have a search on stuff about Dohens in an ICANN, was actually an Auckland sex worker saying that her and all her colleagues never register in Dohens because understandably I think they don't want to have their real name listed um, as the register of their domain, so they always do dot com dot org dot net etc and I thought that was actually quite a good example it's not about criminal behavior or or you know threatened from repressive governments but can you point to that as some people in business who legitimately um, have a case there possibly the solution is exactly what they do there's a thousand GTLDs to choose from um, and there's certainly advantages to dot NZ from having that clearly identifiable information but on the other hand the thing is that people who are running New Zealand businesses feel they don't have the choice there. So it's going to be a quite fascinating consultation when we actually get underway. It's one of those where there's no um, right or wrong answer. Um, it is going to be, I think, getting that balance. 
I thought I'll just, before I go to Andrew, just mention, as I said, I chair the Domain Name Commission Limited, and you've heard from Stephen, who's one of the staff there, Barry's next to him. But if Adam and Lucy at the back can just wave their hands, for some of them uh, may not know you, they've joined the Domain Name Commission board in the last year. So if you're in the industry, or even if you're not, feel free to go up to them, introduce yourself and have a chat about how things are going. We're always keen to also hear on how we can improve things. We'll be doing a formal review of the second level project to report to Internet HNZ, and part of that is, you know, what could we have done better? Uh, what lessons could have been learnt from it? Andrew. Hello, everyone. Andrew Cushion. I'm, I'm the Work Program Director for Internet HNZ, but I'm going to participate right now, very certainly, as a private citizen, and a very concerned one, actually because, at least in my mind, we, we haven't talked about, or we have in part, with your earlier example, about the, I think, completely legitimate personal safety concerns that some people have in terms of registering .nz domains, and how the who is regime at the moment can work counter to that. Um, and, look, the simple comment that I would make, um, and won't make in your consultation, given my role, is that if it's good enough for the electoral register and the phone book previously to to, to suppress that personal information and have it available only to the registrar, not a proxy server, still held indeed by the Domain Name Commission but not publicly available, then I think that that would be an appropriate response that is aligned with any number of other mechanisms that we have here in New Zealand as well and one that would allow people to consume the .nz product without really having to worry about this. Thanks, Andrew. Stephen? Oh, two things. Uh, David did say within 12 months, actually we're hoping to do this, start the consultation like by October. So these are all excellent questions for us. Um, because we're not a legislative, sorry, because .nz is not a legislative uh, service, would you think you would have to pay for that ability to obfuscate or hide your details? Okay. Sorry, what was that, Don? Uh, pay pass to the mic over. Pay to make it public. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So your so so .nz like many well yeah, all the it, all, so the main thing is for those people who don't know who is is probably the big or acts of searching registrant details is probably the biggest thing that is different among all TLDs top level domains. Um, so if you're a generic top level name, like a .com, you have to fo follow the, the ICANN policies. Um, if you're a new one, such yeah. as .photography, which we like to yeah. pick on, because it's nice and long. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that Chris said about um, people spamming within 24 hours, interesting enough, for those ones, they have to release every domain name, the zone file, publicly accessible. So he was probably grabbed from that public file and probably sent an email. It probably wasn't who is in that situation. Yeah. And, that, and for .nz, you cannot get the zone file, so you cannot grab a list of all 650,000 names. That is effectively impossible for .nz. You can only use the domain search tool on our website, or who is if you use a who is tool. Um, so all country codes, certainly all, all country codes operate different for whois. .uk, which .nz was historically quite similar to, has, has gone quite a different direction. Um, and it's, it's partly based, up, I guess, on, on the nature of your, um, of your economy and your trust in government. And, and I actually personally think that probably New Zealanders trust their government the most out of any country in the world. You could disagree if that should be the case. But as a broad spectrum cross board, and we're a relatively egalitarian society. We all are roughly equal in the scheme of things. So it's, it's, so we can't really look at, well, we can see what others are doing, but the main thing is, will that work for us as a local link community? And it is truly a consultation submission process. Um, submissions are for reading, not for counting. So it's not like if there's 10,000 that say one thing written by, by an automated program. We will review them, we will consider them, and they're all documented. And, and every submission made to the Domain Name Commission is public, unless you explicitly yeah. ask it to be private, and we'll consider it. And then yeah. if there's due course, we'll make it private. Andrew touched on an interesting point where he said if you have a proxy service, you should still have to hand the data over, it just doesn't get published. And that would be a key issue, and I think the generic top level domains, um, they have very thin registries, so in fact the registry doesn't even have that data. If you did it for New Zealand, then it's going to be a case of, well, would you require any proxy services to be New Zealand-based entities so they respond to court orders, or would you actually only allow registrars to be the proxy service, or do you have the registry as the proxy service where um, 
it's the registry that has all the data and you just say I don't want this stuff published. Linked to that is the possibility where there's always, I think most people say, legitimate need to be able to contact the, well, owner's the wrong word, but the person who currently has a domain licensed, and that's usually by email. Um, if you know Facebook, which most of you do, if I'm dpfdpf at Facebook, then the email address dpfdpf at facebook.com automatically redirects to the email address they have on file. Would there be in the future, would a useful service be that your domain name at, say, registry.net.nz automatically forwards to whatever email address you have registered that may not be public? So you don't even have to look up the who is. You want to contact that domain, US email farah.co.nz at registry.net.nz, and you know that will go to the email address on record. Again, this isn't necessarily part of the formal consultation, it's sort of the floating of ideas, but when you get into beyond the first principles of it, the number of ways you can do it's quite immense, and they'll all have different pros and cons. Um, has anyone in the room used a proxy service uh, with an overseas one out of interest? Barry? No, no, just like no, that. Yeah. Actually. So, um, Barry Braley, the, currently I'm the domain name commissioner. I'm also the manager of security policy at the DNC. So, but, oh, there's a, actually, uh, there's a few more questions which have come up here, and I, and I don't have the answers, and it'll be part of the consultation, but it's who would be allowed to use the proxy service? So, that adds a layer of complication because you'd almost have to have an approval process. Is it only private citizens? We've never, DNZ policy is not set up to examine who can be a registrant. It's an open registration approach. So, that have to be that, as well as the who can actually access it. Like, are the are the Chinese police a legitimate point of access if it relates to a Falun Gong site? You have to decide this if you want to go into this road. And I don't have the answers, but there are a lot of questions if you if in this discussion, in my opinion. So I'm looking forward to it as well to see what the community thinks when we start the the uh, consultation. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's my thought. Now, now, link to that, we've got a few folk from NZRS in the room. Does anyone have, are there dot .nz services you don't have at the moment that you'd like to be able to get? Obviously, registering the domain name is the main one, but do people have ideas for what else dot .nz could be providing? I just mentioned the possibility that, you know, your domain name and address automatically redirects, which um, I say is just an idea on the spot, not a proposal. But this is a chance for you, if you have ideas, uh, to be able to share them with people who have a professional interest interest in them? More wider? Any further comments, questions? Chris again. Would there be any merit when you develop policy in this area to think of some sort of uh, body to which you can appeal to which is outside of the countries? to enable uh, someone to assess whether the access was legitimate. I'm just throwing an idea up. So um, I don't know whether it should be part of ICANN or, or whatever, but you would have some body which would be independent of the Chinese police, who seem to be the current uh, named villain, uh, who, who could then appeal to this body and uh, there could be some assessment as to whether their um, application was legitimate and for... Um, proper law enforcement purposes. I trust Simon. I mean, one possible idea is you just have no one has permitted it, and if they want it, they have to produce a warrant or a sufficient thing, which basically says you hand it over to no one, which may be a solution. Yeah. Well, generally, with any information, the general position is uh, you need a warrant. Um, nothing gets handed over just on a um, where you know we'd like you to to do this. But some of the work the DNC staff have done with the courts and the Crown Law, etc., is to say when you have a legitimate need, this may often be more for a takedown order or for information, is to actually say here's a very good form of words to use in court so the court can actually make a judgment that actually uh, we can obey but in the past courts would often sort of make rulings which were 
actually wouldn't achieve what they wanted them to do. So there's quite a lot of educational work sort of going on to allow the court process to happen. But I think it's a very important point is that we have tried very hard in .NZ not to have bodies like our own as the decision maker in terms of you know what's legitimate, what's a good use of a domain name, what's a bad use of a domain name, what words do we approve of. The one area where decisions have had to be made, which is uh, passing off dispute resolutions over abusive use, is we've actually got panels of um, QCs and others who actually hear that, so we just administer the scheme. And, you know, interested to hear contrary views, but we view that as quite important that actually there should be, you know, either a judicial or a set process there rather than just sort of um, decisions by uh, the administrator. Just swapping briefly to DNSSEC, um, which is sort of one of the perennials we talked about a bit last year, but just again, I always like doing the spot polls on a pollster as my day job, um, et cetera. Does anyone in the room have a signed domain name? Oh, wow, this is the most atypical room in New Zealand. Um, how many was that in total? One, two, hands up again. Hands up again. One, two, three, four, four. That, that is a proportion, 10%. Um, for I actually think in the register, uh, someone will tell me, probably 20 or so. No more? 300, all. Oh. Yeah. So we've got a reasonable proportion here. Oh, no, 300 signed to me. Signed, yeah. And from those who've done it, um, pretty easy to do, or is it a bit challenging finding registrars who can do it? Yeah. Daniel Griggs, private citizen. <laughs> um, uh, I do work for I NZRS, want to see the business card. As my, as, uh, yeah, I'm a prof professional private citizen. Um, I, I got two domains signed, and uh, I just asked my registrar to sign them for me, and they, I already asked them to manage my DNS, so it's no further stretch to get them to sign it for me, to trust them to sign it for me as well. And it was a simple tick box, done. And that was meta name. Seriously, if, if, if you don't know, and this is as a, as a user, if you don't want to sign out, use meta name, their system is very easy. They've got a little bit of UI issues in their system, it's quite a technical, but if you want to sign your name, use meta name. They, they are the mm -hmm. registrar for DNSSEC at the moment. Sorry, it might be a kind of a basic question, but what, what, what advantage is assigned? Do you um, Barry or Sebastian or David, one of you three, wish to? Sebastian Castron Cereres. I was the technical lead for the DNSSEC project. Um, so the, the, the benefit for assigned domain is um, if you are behind a validating cache, it will check if the responses have been tampered with in the, in the path. So you have authenticity of the DNS data. And that's a platform for a whole set of a new level of um, encryption and other services. So for example, one work that's been done in the, at the ITF is to have um, encrypted email. You can go and publish a fingerprint for a certificate for your mail server. And if someone else is interested in sending you a secure encrypted email from server to server, go and find the record, validate it, it's good, let's go and encrypt this session. So you can avoid being uh, inspected in the, in the past. And um, in Germany, that, that idea is actually picking up very strongly in Germany. So there is a, actually a few ISPs and registrar that are offering, yeah, we do the NSEC and we support uh, secure email for your customers if you're interested. And and they have some like really interesting cases around that. So, and there are countries, uh, for example, Sweden, uh, Norway, Netherlands, that have roughly 40% or 50% adoption of the NSEC at the domain name, domain name level. So, Sri Lanka as well. Okay. On that, one of the policy challenges we've looked at is how does Netherlands, for example, get 50%, but they effectively, by default, 
have your registrar sign your domain for you. You don't have to say you want it. And the downside of that, though, is it can then make transferring to another registrar more difficult. Uh, it actually can reduce flexibility there. So we haven't sort of been at all thinking that making it the default option will benefit the average person, but that has been approach taken some. I believe I'll be corrected here that I'm not sure there's a time frame, but Gov.NZ, the moderator of Gov.NZ, has said they want to have all of Gov.NZ signed by a separate date. And I think most people would say that's a really smart subdomain that you would expect to have that security have been signed. Um, I'm not sure if the banks have gone that way, but um, mind you, we've been trying to get the banks onto Bank.NZ for 10 years, so yes, they're not fast movers there. Robert White, I work for the Department of General Affairs. So just for, the, for those that don't know, we're targeting signing.gov.nz domains for all agencies towards the end of this year. Uh, that's our target date. So oh, I didn't is, realise it's that happening. quick. Excellent. Oh, it's a little bit behind, but we're getting there. <laughs> cool. Is it all names in gov.nz or all names you provide name service for? There's a difference. Um, GTLDs, who out of the 800 or so new ones, uh, put your hands up if you've actually grabbed any of the new ones, be keen to hear. How many have grabbed the Dot Kiwi? <laughs> David puts his hand down. <laughs> no, no Dot Kiwis here, but other GTLDs from the new ones? Which ones? Just starting here. I grabbed a Dot Boutique for a company from my wife. And over there, there was a couple of others. That's all. Cool. Any others? That looks like three in the room, etc. David. Uh, just if people are interested, in terms of numbers, there's a, a website called uh, ntldstats.com which provides a breakdown of uh, these new um, top-level domains that are being released. Um, there is a page on there that shows the numbers of new t um, TLDs being registered from New Zealand. Um, they currently number about 29,000, um, 1.7-ish percent of market share, so within the the, in, well, the New Zealand space. So, um, you know, small incremental growth at this stage. Am I right in thinking .com's normally around 28 and .nz 65, is that roughly...? Uh, .nz accounts for about 68% now, um, .com for around uh, a little under 30% and then the rest is a, is a mix of uh, legacy GTLDs and new GTLDs. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe I'll be correct again here, but I think the most popular new TLD, it's not one you would guess, I think it's .xyz. Uh, but there is a reason for that, which is basically free giveaways. It's going to be a couple of years till you get past some of the, the, the freebie well. ones to actually see which have been the really successful ones, uh, which ones haven't been successful, and is there going to be some sort of amalgamation as uh, ones don't meet their startup costs, are they going to be then picked up by other players? So uh, interesting. So there's about 700 new GTLDs that have launched, all the NTLDs because you've got to give our numbers to everything. Interesting enough, XYZ, yes, there was a bunch of giveaways, but also there's a significant registration of XYZ in Asia because as an English speaker growing up, I was learned, you know, generically reference English, it was ABC. In Asia, you reference English language as XYZ. So it actually means something as generically English in most Asian countries. So there is a significant adoption of XYZ in Asia. While hundreds of thousands of names were given away cheap or free, uh, it has got significant penetration in Asia, which is fascinating. Um, it's got a million, over a million registrations. There's only about six million registrations in the new GTLDs. Most are sitting at under 5,000, under 3,000. Okay, any final comments or questions?
Otherwise, I think we'll give people a slightly early afternoon tea break, etc. So, look, thanks for coming. As I say, you've heard from various people on staff and governance roles in the room. Feel free to carry on any conversations with them. Uh, and also, when we do do the formal consultations, there's nothing we love more than actually getting submissions. Um, well, as you know, the staff probably quite like it when there's very few, but as governors, we quite like having lots of submissions to, to, to weigh our way through. Uh, so, thanks for your time and we'll see you at the next session which is when does the next session start is it 2 45 or 2 30 cool so enjoy a break for now thanks <laughs>